I'm going to be referring to a paragraph uh, in the book you see here called Fatigue in Composites. Uh, it's a rather interesting book. I'd like to purchase it, but it's rather expensive. So I did find some excerpts that I'm going to be referring to. Uh, any mechanical engineers that are uh, watching this, if you want to chime in, please do so. Uh, here's a, uh, a chapter or a paragraph uh, under fatigue and durability of marine composites. Uh, fatigue is an engineering term that uh, means failure. Uh, what they're saying here that I have highlighted uh, in, in yellow, it says uh, basically composite cylinders tested to failure under hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic is uh, water pertaining to water and static pressure. It says fail by one of two mechanisms, buckling or compressive material failure. It says the former has received considerable study as thin-walled cylinders are used in many applications apart from deep sea vessels. So that means there's been a lot of study uh, in thin wall materials, but not a heck of a lot of study uh, in deep sea vessels. Uh, thin wall materials, uh, five inches thick, I'm assuming, is not a thin wall uh, vessel. So um, it says uh, designers are generally happier with designing for buckling than for material failure. Now, um, there is a ratio they talk about here. Uh, it's the ratio of the thickness uh, of the material to the diameter of the vessel. And I've done some calculating. Uh, again, I used 12 feet as a guesstimation, and we know uh, the diameter is approximately 8 feet, and the thickness of the composites is 5 inches. So they're s saying here in another paragraph, um, or another, the bottom of this paragraph, that uh, if your thickness to diameter ratio increases abo above 0.1, um, it says mater material failure under biaxial compression. That means biaxial is more than one axis, uh, becomes more likely. But I did some calculating, and I my ratio is 0.05. So that wouldn't apply so much to uh, the Titan sub, but it does say down here, um, it says, it says their predictions of failure were very sensitive to the input ply compression strength. So again, and remember what I said earlier, um, your compression of your different plies is very critical here. So um, in the case of a, a ratio here of uh, a, th a thickness to diameter ratio is above 0.1, we would then have, uh, again, uh, we would have to be very sensitive to the input ply compression strength. Uh, but I think that's going to uh, possibly affect uh, what happened to the sub for a different reason or the submersible to a different reason, which we'll get into here. Here we're sitting on the Wikipedia page for uh, the engineering uh, definition of deformation. Um, I'm going to try to um, put uh, a lot of this in layman's terms. I might even oversimplify it just a bit. So again, uh, it may not be exact, but I'm going to try to get this as close as I can. Again, any, any engineers out there, mechanical engineers, please correct me if I'm wrong. So. There, I'm sure everyone has heard of stress and strain. These are actually engineering terms. Uh, stress is defined as a force that is applied to a particular object. So in the case of the, uh, the Titan submersible, uh, when it goes underwater, the deeper it goes, the more stress is applied to the, the pressure vessel of the sub. Now, strain is the resulting 
deformation or deflection as a result of the stress. So as that sub or submersible goes deeper, uh, it's going to have more stress. And as a result, it's going to have more deformation on its surface. Okay, now, as you go up and down in that sub repeatedly, uh, you're, again, those stresses and strains are going to be uh, applied and then backed off as you then come back up to the surface. And as you do that, apply those stress and strains the deformation in that material repeatedly it breaks down uh, that material uh, in this case the uh, carbon fiber and titanium uh, portions of the pressure vessel now there's different types of deformation there's a elastic deformation and what that says and i'll paraphrase it here for you is elastic deformation is when you apply the pressure uh, and then you get a resultant deformation in the material and in this case the titanium and the carbon fiber when you pull that pressure away or decrease that pressure the deformation then recovers and comes back uh, and it, there is no long-lasting or deformation that stays. So as long as you stay within the, the limitations of, of that material, you can apply elastic deformation over and over without getting any uh, permanent deformation. But again, if you repeatedly dive the submarine and then surface again, you're cycling those stresses and strains over and over again, which ultimately will weaken uh, the material. Now, there's something, if you go beyond a particular stress uh, and you, you get into a higher deformation, uh, this is called plastic deformation. What happens is when you apply the stress, in this particular case, you're, you're applying it uh, more than in the... Uh, the elastic deformation. What happens here is you apply a greater stress, the deformation occurs, but when you back off that stress, the deformation does not recover. So in other words, you are stretching that material, which it's, it's referred to as a necking phase, and it does not recover uh, from that uh, deformation. Uh, and if that occurs, it then weakens the structure. So as you then come back, let's say do more and more dives, uh, it ultimately leads, if you keep on uh, getting into the plastic deformation, uh, what ultimately happens is you get a fracture. And a fracture is an engineering definition. It's irreversible. Basically, you get a failure in the material. So. One of the things that was mentioned in the news uh, is that uh, Stockton Rush was not a big fan of following um, uh, the rules and regulations. And he claimed that uh, he did not. And one of the people that he filed a lawsuit to, and again, this is all based in the news, so I don't know if this is accurate or not. I'm just strictly going by what was said in the news. He did not perform any uh, NDT, non-destructive testing, or uh, non-destructive investigation on the composite material or the titanium material. Uh, and if he would have, and again, uh, in, in listening to the news, they interviewed um, an engineer at a composites company. They basically said, to perform an ultrasonic inspection on a pressure vessel of that size would be about $20,000. And uh, again, uh, it would make uh, very wise sense to perform this type of inspection after every single dive. Uh, because again, you're by repeatedly diving and resurfacing, you're you're repeating the stress and strain cycle, which ultimately over time is going to weaken 
uh, the structure of the pressure vessel and ultimately if you don't catch it in time uh, lead to a permanent defor deformation which would then lead to a fracture so again this is i'm just paraphrasing the the paraphrasing the engineering data here so let's uh talk about one more really important thing uh about an about the materials that are used in the pressure vessel. Remember we said the the hemispherical covers or end caps are made of titanium and the center portion is made of carbon fiber. There's another engineering term we want to discuss. Um, this is a mechanical property called Young's modulus. And again, I'm going to paraphrase uh, what this is. We don't need to get into real scientific of it. We're just going to explain it. It's ba basically a mechanical property that measures the tensile or compressive stiffness of a solid material when the force is applied lengthwise. Now remember we said the strength of carbon fiber is in the lengthwise direction. Now tensile is a pulling. It's be if you took like a string and you pulled at each end of the string. If you pulled hard enough, the string would snap. Uh, that is a, a tensile uh, measurement of tensile stiffness. Now a compressive stiffness is let's say you took a ruler and you put it between two chairs and you are two chairs or two stools and you suspended it across that and you pushed in the center of that till the ruler snapped that would be a compressive stiffness okay so this young's modulus is a measurement of as i said of the stiffness of various materials now let me read some of these stiffnesses to you to put it in perspective uh, let's take a look at aluminum or aluminium if you're uh, in the UK. Uh, the Young's modulus of aluminum has uh, a measurement of 68. Okay, that's, that means that the st it's not as stiff. It's a bit more elastic. Okay, then we move up to titanium. Now the hemispherical covers uh, on the pressure vessel are made of titanium. Titanium has a Young's modulus of 116. And then remember what I said about carbon. Carbon fiber is extremely stiff. It does not stretch very well, and it's sensitive to impact. Okay, so a carbon fiber has a Young's modulus of 181. So after simplifying some of the engineering principles, let's take a look at a couple scenarios that could have happened. Um, James Cameron came out and made a statement here recently that more than likely the sub made it to the bottom. Uh, their acoustic warning system uh, went off. They dropped their weights and they started to ascend back up to the surface. Uh, at that point, um, an implosion occurred. Now again, we don't know if this is what really happens. It's just conjecture, but uh, I would imagine that that's a, a pretty pretty good idea of, of what happened. Um, Stockton Rush indicated that he did have this acoustic warning uh, system that would uh, raise an alarm uh, when there was any kind of uh, fracturing occurring or any type of uh, weakening occurring in the carbon fiber. Uh, but as we've already discussed, when carbon fiber fails, it just doesn't slowly crack. Uh, it fails explosively. Now, looking at, uh, we have the titanium hemispheres here, and we have flanges uh, that were uh, glued with a, uh, an epoxy adhesive, more than likely. Again, we don't know what that adhesive was. Uh, I've seen some video of them applying the adhesive uh, to uh, the titanium and the carbon fiber. Uh, it was rather thick, but most uh, epoxy adhesives are rather thick. So looking at the, the engineering information on Young's modulus of titanium, 
which again is around 116. Carbon fiber having a Young's modulus of 181. So carbon fiber is very stiff. It doesn't stretch, uh, it doesn't give, uh, but yet titanium uh, is a, a little bit more elastic uh, than carbon fiber. And again, with the repeated stresses and, tr and strains of those earlier dives, more than likely what could have happened is the epoxy adhesive uh, could have weakened. Again, titanium is going to be a bit more elastic, so it's going to expand and contract with depth a little bit more than uh, the carbon fiber. So, if you will, that repeated uh, stress and strain could theoretically have weakened the epoxy bond between the, the titanium flange and the carbon fiber, which could then, of course, ruptured at that depth. Again, we're talking a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, there's been reports that it's between five and 6,000 PSI. Another possible scenario is there could have been some weaknesses or voids in the carbon fiber, or due to the repeated stressing and straining, uh, it weakened some areas in the carbon fiber, uh, and the carbon fiber could have buckled. Uh, we looked at uh, some of the engineering data that says uh, more than likely carbon fiber is going to buckle. So we have two possible scenarios here. The flange and the flange material uh, and the adhesive between the flange and the carbon fiber could have been weakened, or we could have had some weak spots in the actual carbon fiber. And again, when carbon fiber lets go or fails, uh, engineering term is fatigue. It could have been almost immediate and quite disastrous. So that's sort of some theory based on uh, what we've looked at already. Um, I've heard that today they've uh, recovered some of the pieces um, of the pressure vessel, the titanium hem hemispheres. So I'm assuming uh, they're going to do some engineering analysis on that and hopefully we'll report to the media uh, what they found. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this information. And uh, again, this is sort of some theories that I put together and some theories of what I found by listening to some uh, engineering firms uh, out in the media. Again, the one individual uh, said that, uh, uh, engineering firm said that in order to perform a ultrasonic inspection on a, a vessel of this size would be around $20,000. And I would definitely recommend that this type of inspection, uh, again, an NDT, uh, <clears throat> non-destructive testing or non-destructive investigation be performed after every dive. Uh, Stockton Rush uh, felt he didn't need that type of testing. Uh, and I think that was a, a failure on his part uh, depending uh, on his acoustic system, which uh, would not give him enough warning in time due to what we've seen on how carbon fiber fractures and fails. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time.